um, let's hand it to Jeff and his presentation. Thank you. All right. How's everybody doing today? It's the last one. I think folks have been sitting for a little bit of time. Hopefully this will jazz you up a little bit. I'm going to look at things from kind of the uh, a national perspective, an uh, overview of, of, of what's kind of going all around the country. Um, first, a little bit about myself. I uh, got a great introduction just a second ago, but I just wanted to kind of go back and let you guys know a, a little bit about what I do. Um, I have an undergrad in geography from the University of Texas, as well as a master's in city planning. And eight years ago, I started at a, an organization called Reconnect, or actually 14 years ago, in 2005. Um, at an organization called Reconnecting in America in the Center for TOD. And we are basically a think tank that focused on transportation and housing and as it relates to transit. Um, we also had a federal grant through the FTA. And one of the first projects I ever worked on was a project. Uh, can you hear me? I yes. feel like I'm talking down here. OK, good. Um, was a project that was uh, where the HUD, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the FTA worked together for the first time ever in 2007. That might surprise you a little bit because you'd think that housing and transportation go hand in hand, in which they do, but they had never worked together before this project that we did. So it's, it's quite amazing to where we've gotten now. And out of that project came uh, the Sustainability, Sustainable Communities uh, Coalition, where EPA, HUD, and FTA were actually working together during the Obama administration. So um, after Reconnecting America disappeared, I had actually, during the Reconnecting America times, I had started a blog called The Overhead Wire. But I also started a newsletter that I did for Reconnecting America about cities, transportation, urban planning, urban issues. And um, you know, after Reconnecting America disappeared, I started my own company, which was scary and daunting. But at the same time, it was fun and exciting because I got to learn all this stuff about what was going on around the country. And now I do a newsletter every day for subscribers and people that subscribe um, I go through about 1,500 news articles every single day on the topics of housing, urban planning, transportation, and those issues. And I pick the 30 that I think are the most important for the day. I've collected over 55,000 links over the last six years. And um, so that's what my company basically does. Um, we have a newsletter. Uh, and then we also have the podcast, which I do every week. So Mondays at the Overhead Wire, we talk about all the news that happened the week before. And then on Thursdays, we have a podcast called Talking Headways. So that's like my background in terms of transportation. Um, but John emailed me back in June asking if I could come down and talk about the importance of, of transit regionally. And I was excited because I'm not super familiar with the place, but my family actually has some roots here in, San, in Santa, Santa Cruz. On my mother's side, uh, one of my Irish ancestors actually came to work at a ranch just outside of Santa Cruz in 1836, so before the gold rush even. Um, and my mom, who grew up in San Francisco, actually came down to Santa Cruz uh, to visit her grandparents every summer and uh, still talks fondly of it. She always talks about coming down in the summers to Santa Cruz and visiting grandparents and going to the beach and everything like that. And then my sister went to UC Santa Cruz. So I was born and raised in Texas, but I have a deep connection to California and to the Santa Cruz uh, here. Um, but I want to talk about some bigger ideas about transportation that we've learned, uh, you know, from, uh, that I've learned from my work around the country. Um, so for the last 15 years, I've been thinking about housing. And you might ask yourself, what does housing have to do with transportation? So on the American budget chart, which this is a, the a household budget for uh, the average American, um, transportation is the second highest expenditure after housing. You can see 33% for housing, 15% for transportation. And so those things go together hand in hand. And in a place like Santa Cruz, this is the Housing and Transportation Affordability Index that's done by CNT. Um, the regional in, a moderate regional income here is 55000 a year. And housing plus transportation costs can be 66% of people's income at that, at that level, at 55000 Now, that's not everybody, but it's a fair amount of folks that are stretched because of their, the household budgets being taken up by housing and transportation. 22% of that comes from transportation, and 44% of it is housing. You know housing is expensive. You lived here. Um, I, I live in San Francisco. I understand acutely that, that specific problem. But for folks that have lower incomes, housing is already a burden, and, trans, and transportation is becoming an even larger burden. And to, having to own and keep up a car, for instance, adds to that burden specifically. This is the HTA index for uh, Santa Cruz County. And I tried to get the whole county, but it's hard when you're trying to do a map that <laughs> connects in a certain ways. So I got Santa Cruz, I got Watsonville, so you can kind of see you can have lower transportation housing plus transportation costs if you live in the urban areas, um, but it gets worse if you get moved further out and you have to drive a lot more. 
Another issue that we talk about a lot is access. Um, because of this, we also started thinking about transportation, not in terms of how open the roads are, but rather what you can access uh, rather than just specific mobility. Uh, mobility is the ability to go a long distance in a certain amount of time. Access is how many places you can get to of importance in a certain amount of time. So thinking about, um, you know, you live outside of the city. In my neighborhood in the center of San Francisco, I can get to a grocery store within a 10-minute walk. I can get to the bus in a, a five-minute walk. I can get to BART in a five-minute walk. I can get to bars really quickly. I have a lot of access. Um, if I got in my car, it would take way longer to do those things. Um, but this is how we often think about congestion in terms of mobility. It's, it's, it's why we widen freeways. Um, but it's really not thinking about people, but rather vehicles instead of people. Um, people want to get where they're going in a timely manner, and it's easier to do so if those things are closer, even if the roads are wider, longer, and congestion-free. So how do we know they want to get there in a timely manner? So a recent survey done by Scoop found that 62% of, of 7,000 people surveyed in 14 regions said they didn't apply to a job because of the commute. That's 62% of folks. They didn't apply to a job that they could have gotten because of the commute. 30% had considered quitting a job because of the commute. So this is a big issue. These are serious numbers, and we need to think about them in the context of the region's access, not to mention people's well-being and health. Um, I know that folks understand that commuting in a car is not the most healthy thing, and it gets, gives you road rage, and by the time you're home, you're somewhat upset. I used to do it when I was in Texas a lot. Um, and here you see two examples of access by transit. So here's San Francisco's example, and then here's Santa Cruz's example. You can kind of see the differences between the two in that Santa Cruz has that really great bright red color, um, and Oakland as well. And then, sorry about that, Santa Cruz <laughs> and Watsonville uh, look like this on that access chart. Um, now, if you look at Santa Cruz, the places that should have great transit access, uh, they, they look kind of a cool green instead of that, that awesome red. Um, and you can do more research and check out a lot of these maps and de detailed data by going to the Accessibility Observatory at the University of Minnesota. We actually just recently had Andrew Owen on the podcast um, to talk about this uh, subject specifically, which was super awesome. Could you repeat that? Accessibility? Yeah, the accessibility in uh, the accessibility. Uh, <laughs> It's the uh, Accessibility Observatory at the University of Minnesota. Sorry about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so states and regions are starting to think about accessibility. Um, soon they're going to be prioritizing projects by accessibility, not just transit, but access to jobs. So this is what the state of Virginia is doing. This is what Hawaii is piloting. Uh, it's bipartisan, too. I had a colleague who I just had also had on the podcast who was talking about um, how she's making this happen. She went to... Uh, senators from different states, some of whom are very liberal, some of whom, whom are very conservative. And they all agreed that access to jobs was a really important metric because of the way we spend money. Um, and the Bay Area is going to have about a $100 billion mega measure soon. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going to be on that because I haven't read it in great detail. But I think we're going to also prioritize using access to jobs rather than just giving out money based on political um, favors or who needs, uh, who has a specific need on a specific project, which I think is going to be valuable. So in fact, um, last Thursday, T for America, which is a national nonprofit focused on federal transportation policy, they said they're going to stop asking Congress to increase spending on transportation until they can set up actual goals that give people more access and repair existing assets rather than just giving out money based on formulas. Um, so we might need to start to shift uh, how, we see how funding works at the state and federal levels. We might start to see a shift. And uh, it might be more geared towards people giving access to opportunity rather than just building something. Um, but this is not to say that all places are suited for transit, biking, and walking. But the places where uh, there are concentrations of jobs and housing are places where you can easily improve access with transit investments, biking investments, walking investments. And as you've seen uh, in the presentations previously, it makes a lot of sense. Um, With small investments in transit operations, you can move many more people in the same space. So you might ask me, we've talked about housing budgets. We've talked about access. What does it all mean for, for us? Um, why should we care about this stuff? So here in Santa Cruz County, you have a population of about 275,000 people in 2017, and you had just over 100,000 jobs. In order to make money and to participate in the economy, people need jobs, and they need access to those jobs. And a good percentage of workers are going, for the most part, to two places in the region for jobs, Santa Cruz and Watsonville. 
So here is what, where your jobs are concentrated in the region that could support better transit. So this is uh, actually a program that's really easy to access. It's called On the Map. Um, it's, through the long, it's called the Longitudinal Employment Household Dynamics Data Set. And I know it's kind of a, kind of a wonky thing, but it's done uh, by, it's part of the census now. And you can actually go to On the Map, um, just search for it on Google and you'll find it. And you can make these maps of where people work, where people live, where they're going to, and where they're coming from. This is actually a map of the, the employment and the density of employment in your region. This is a lot of what I did when I was at Reconnecting America. I made these maps. It's super fun. Um, and here's where uh, workers who, live, who work in downtown Santa Cruz live uh, in high concentrations. So you can see I made the little kind of, it's not exact, obviously, but that like orange uh, outline is actually the outline that I made to get the data of the workers in that district and asked the computer and said, hey, where do these people live? And they work in these, in these areas that have high concentrations of purple, as you can see. Um, and then here, thinking about this, these are the places that, and if you looked at, uh, you know, think about that, and you think about that in the context, here's the, the areas of purple, there's the areas of purple, but here's your frequent transit map. So I want to show you this, um, you know, here's your frequent bus service. Now, I understand small agencies have constraints. I know there's a lot of political pressure from folks who just don't care about buses, um, but your two biggest areas of concentrated jobs and housing are only connected by buses that come every 30 minutes. So that's something that can be improved upon. So I want to show you this access slide again because it matters. We can do so much better. We can connect people with jobs that they need to get to and activities they want to go to by increasing the frequency of transit. So I have a quick aside. Um, with, fr with freeways, about 70 years ago, we built a system where they cut through cities, killed off many thriving black and Latino neighborhoods and commercial centers, and the goal was to get suburbanites through cities, not to cities. Um, in this new paradigm, we want people to have access to cities. We want our transit lines to go directly into the core. So I always use this example to many people's chagrin in Austin. Uh, in the year 2000, there was actually a light rail election, and George Bush was on the ballot, and I was there at the time in school. And it lost by less than 2,000 votes in a very heavily um, conservative uh, area. Austin's not necessarily conservative, but this, the county as a whole where this was, the vote took place. But it only lost by less than 2,000 votes. And that meant to the state leaders who involved themselves in Austin politics a little bit too much that people didn't want it. This line, the orange line, go, or the, actually the yellow line going down the center, would have gotten 38,000 riders and cost around a billion dollars. Now, that, that might sound like a lot of money, but the, the leaders wimped out. They went with the line that went around the employment, around the housing. This is where all the people live. They go to the University of Texas. They go to the state complex. They go to downtown. 250,000 jobs, 50,000 students. The whole center of the state of Texas is here, and they went around it. It costs $60, 60 million, and it gets about 2,000 riders. So I want you to think about connecting people to places. Allowing them access is important. I always include this because I don't want anybody making this mistake again. I know the people in Austin get mad at me when I say this, but it's true. I did my master's thesis on the politics of rail in Austin. It is messy. <laughs> so that fear of building a rail, rail line down a main artery in Austin also ignores the, re the realities of space. And like everyone else, you here in Santa Cruz don't have space to expand roads uh, so everyone can drive a car, what me what, which means active transportation like the bus, walking, biking, or, and the future rail can, can help everyone get to where they need to go without taking up more space. This is a street in Zurich. My uh, good friend Norman Garrick, who's an engineering professor at the University of Connecticut, took this picture. It was actually in City Lab just a couple of days ago. He took a sabbatical in Zurich, and I want to tell you about how many people each of these lanes uh, takes. Not how many vehicles, but how many people. This, where the cars are stacked up, he counted, he sat on the corner all day, he counted 500 cars an hour, 550 people an hour. This lane, trams every five to 10 minutes, 3,500 people an hour. So what looks congested is actually a place where people can get to where they want to go quickly. But your transit ridership here in Santa Cruz has been falling, and your service has been cut, and your congestion has been growing. According to the National Transit Database, ridership has gone from 6.9 million annual trips in 1991 to just under 5.2 million in 2017. 
as the population has grown. But you're not alone. This is happening all over the country. Cities and counties operating transit systems are seeing drops in ridership as, as car trips increase and support decreases. Um, but fear not. There are agencies and systems where things are changing. Big cities like Houston have reimagined bus networks and seen ridership increases. Seattle has increased service and seen ridership increase as well. Austin, San Antonio, Pittsburgh, and Las Vegas too. They've focused on service, on key corridors, and seen ridership grow. This is Houston's bus network before their bus network reimagining. They didn't use any extra resources to reimagine their network. The red lines are the frequent service. They get about come every 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so. This is a before, and then this is after. Wow. This is thinking about the bus network in a different way, focusing resources on specific corridors that come more frequently and get more ridership. There are cautionary tales, though. Denver and LA have invested heavily in rail transit, just as Houston and Seattle have. And yet they didn't focus as much on their existing bus, bus network. Uh, so while Houston and Seattle ridership have been growing, and their rail ridership has been growing as well, uh, LA and Denver actually have been losing riders. A network is a complete network, not just a single part of it. You'll need trunk lines, you'll need feeders, and a seamless connection. But the network as a whole and frequency are key to gaining ridership. But in Santa Cruz, it isn't a big city like these places. You're not going to have the same resources as the fourth, fourth largest city in the country, Houston. But what's some of the, what are some of the other examples of smaller places that are doing this? Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, Richmond, Virginia have all done similar things and seen similar results. This is Richmond, Virginia. I will say Indianapolis is a very conservative city and a very conservative state. They actually had um, their state legislature vote to say that they just couldn't build light rail. They're not allowed to. So they went with BRT instead, and they just opened their first line uh, a couple weeks ago. They had to, they had to go uh, you know, through hoops to get a, a sales tax uh, measure passed, but they did. So Richmond has a population of 227,000, though regionally it's about 1.2 million. Um, but it's rezoned for density near transit. It built a spine of BRT on the core, and it rec reorganized its bus network to serve people on frequent routes. This is the system as it is now. With the frequency changes to the network, they actually uh, have up uh, their ridership has gone up in the last year 25%. So there's also little things that uh, cities can do to facilitate transit. I see you have choke points here between Santa Cruz and Watsonville. Uh, there are companies that are starting to use big data and GPS trackers on buses to see where the slow spots are. So instead of building a whole BRT line on one of your frequent corridors, maybe you can only certain maybe only certain parts need attention. So maybe that means you can get a better level of service using similar resources, just as Houston did. Um, so this is actually from Swiftly, which is one of the companies. There's a, a couple of companies, but this is a company that does it. And so they have a bus tracker, and they tell you what the speeds are historically historic data going back 10 years, looking at the speeds of, of specific buses on specific corridors. And you see where the green spots are. Those are spaces where you don't likely need to have a bus lane because they're already going at, a, at the regular speed. But the places where the red spots are, those are the spots that get bogged down in traffic at traffic lights where there's a lot of crossings and things like that. So maybe along certain corridors, you don't have to make a full investment. You can only pinpoint, make tactical, tactical switches. So, so what did we learn? Housing and transportation should be a bigger consideration in regional planning for transportation. We should stop forcing vulnerable residents to shoulder more of the burden uh, than their bu budgets can take. Workers are tired of the commute, and employers need to understand this is a major factor in broadening their access to labor. Not everyone will be able to drive, but everyone needs access to jobs and services. Here in Santa Cruz, you have the urban form. You can build a network that works for people. Uh, the climate emergency is upon us. Cars, even if electric, are big polluters. We just found out from some research by the SF Estuary Institute that 7 trillion microplastic pieces from car and truck tires are washed into the SF Bay every year. We can do better. And finally, access is more important than mobility. Getting people where they want to go is more important than moving single occupancy vehicles quickly. We have limited space. Let's use it wisely. And thanks for your time. I hope everybody has been smart.